show live from Studio B here in the West Loop of Chicago in our CHGO studios. I'm your host, Sean Anderson. You can follow me on Twitter at Sean underscore W underscore Anderson. You can follow the show on Twitter at CHGO underscore White Sox. Alongside me, as always, the biggest presence in White Sox media um, and honestly the biggest media presence in Chicago, Herb Lawrence. Incorrect. Hello. That's I correct in my mind. Uh, I see you every day. Uh, you can follow him <laughs> on Twitter at Eggner All Twenty Three. He's our CHGO White Sox community leader. Um, Herb, mm-hmm. not to, um, I got this would be a really dark joke. Do it. Am I allowed one? Yes. I, I, if people are missing, those people have families. It's very sad. Herb, would you rather be? Would you rather have paid two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to be four thousand feet? Uh, below sea level in a submarine that's only uh, unlockable by somebody on the surface. Okay. Or watch White Sox baseball. It's a hard question. And it's not dark because those people did a dumb thing where they're going into the ocean where the ocean scary people. This is a... Uh, they're this going a, to a graveyard this, in yeah, the ocean. This is a PSA for you guys. So if you're thinking about it, if you got an extra 250000 Firstly, donate to me if you're going to be throwing away. Secondly, become a diehard. Do not, do not go to the ocean. The ocean is very scary, especially if you go to the depths of the ocean to see a boat that sank over 100 plus years ago. So I would still pick the White Sox game because the ocean is the thing you don't want to mess with in the universe. I would rather go in outer space than go into the ocean. You, 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 things in the ocean, there's numerous things that can kill you in the ocean, especially. Big ass squids, and I'm sure that's probably what what took them. Big ass squid, a big ass whale, some thing. And I just saw a video of the actual container that they're in, the mm-hmm. submarine yeah. that they're in. It's not luxury; it is crap. So, you know, I'm sorry you guys are probably dead, but well, you did a dumbass thing. I, I did actually get a message. One of them's watching the post game tonight. Are they? Oh, yeah, they're uh, avid White Sox inside of a they, whale's stomach. They uh, they also donate. Not only did they uh, pay two hundred fifty thousand dollars to be in a submarine to go visit dead people uh, who died hundreds of years ago, uh, but they also uh, donated to the sell the uh, Jerry Team billboard. Awesome. So you know, I mean, hey, people have a, a, a capital. Uh, anyways, uh, if you're watching the broadcast, uh, I don't know why you would. They had a little trivia, Herb. They did. We have this calendar, and you're like, we, we only never use the trivia. Yeah, my so, uh, uh, my fiance's mother gave me that for uh, Christmas. Shout out Courtney's mom. Um, also, happy Juneteenth as well. A little Thumbs up on that one. Uh, happy Juneteenth uh, to everyone out there. Um, on this date in 1977, Herb, what member of the White Sox belted out the national anthem before the first game of a doubleheader, then belted two home runs at a 2-1 to one victory over the Athletics? Um... What's the... Um, and Steve Stone was his teammate. Klazuski. No. Um, Kaczynski. Kaczynski. Uh, it's a, he's a, oh, Ted know, Kaczynski, he's not, the uh, not a good Unabomber. Yeah. Um, former White Sox great, Ted Kaczynski. Um, I don't know. Oscar Gamble. Uh, uh, Lamar Johnson. I wouldn't. I, I remember that name, but I forgot. Yeah, if you were watching the broadcast, they even showed a picture of uh, Lamar Johnson as well. I was, but you I don't remember when they showed the guy, the the fellow in the the socks. Like uh, I think he was in the softball p- tri- shorts. Mm-hmm. You, you forgot that part? I did forget that part. Mm-hmm. I left I it out of my me. memory after I saw the White Sox and what they did today. Yeah, what, what part multiple you, things they did wrong in this game? What part did you start blacking out? Was it the first hard hit ball by Josh Young? Was it the second hard hit ball by Josh Young? Was it the point when Kendall Graveman almost blacked out from a hard hit ball from Josh Young? Um, I mean, what what point did the White Sox baseball just become too much and succumb? Uh, and you know, when did you start succumbing to it? Well, we were telling the Cubs guys, the CHO Cubs guys who are on right now, hey, it was 3 nothing. I think it was the sixth inning. This game is over. The White Sox are not going to score any runs. Then the White Sox get back-to-back home runs. They get one from Vaughn. They get one, of course, from Luis Robert Jr. And then um, we go into is the seventh inning. You see Aaron Bummer come in the game, and he's doing all right, doing fine. He gives, I think he gave up a, a ground out to Seager. Then he gives up a ground out to Jung. And then, they, so they got two outs with a guy, I think, on second or third at this point. Instead of saying four, mm-hmm. intentionally walking out Elise Garcia because he kills lefties and it's a bad matchup for Bummer, he straight pitches around. And, Steven, if you can bring up the graphic for yeah. the actual graphic for 
this pitch. Here, well, why don't you go go, oh, go to the first one? one. Okay. So, yeah. Why don't we do this in order? So you bring up the Seager one. Um, that's the first at bat. Also, the Sox lost five to two tonight. Uh, whoops, I, I didn't People bring know that. that. Yeah, the 12 games under 500. It's on screen. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit <laughs> more. With, uh, I just people. put it on screen. I was waiting the whole time for Sean to do his thing where we're coming to you live after a White Sox, and then there's like a five-minute pause, and I mean, he does it. I mean, if you listen and if you watch White Sox games, you know they lost. Yeah, that bit got old real yeah. quick. Uh, make sure you're hitting that thumbs-up button, too. Uh, but so, as you mentioned, they pitched to Seager, um, right? And this is after Simeon gets on. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, you see three pitches there, and they're well located yes. on the edges, right? That's Seeger. They get the ground out, and that was a uh, nice play by Berger, right? Uh, Berger, I think, was the Jung one. Oh, okay. All right. Oh, well, let's go to the, the – no, not the Jung the, one. The, the, that was the one. Oh, the, the, the Jung one. I'm sorry. My bad. Uh, he hit so many balls hard today that it's surprising that he, they got him out. Um, but three pitches, again, outside part of the plate. But, um, in, but mostly close to the zone. Yes, and then Vaughn makes that play. Yes, Vaughn made it that play. Diving play gets uh, Jung out. I think uh, Simeon advances to third. And then as you bring up, they pitch around Garcia, and like, none of these are competitive. If you're watching the the screen right now, the first pitch is that red dot that's kind of close to the strike zone, and then all the subsequent pitches are all sinkers that are way off the zone. Like, it was an obvious pitch around. You heard Steve, you heard Jason Bonetti say, this is a pitch around. I understand sometimes from time to time managers do this, but usually when you get to two strikes and you see this guy not offering at the balls that you're throwing obviously off the plate to pitch around him, then you say, okay, four, go to first. No, they just continue to ball, throw ball three and continue to ball, throw ball four. The next hitter, a lefty, the person they wanted to get the matchup against, is low, and he can't find his release point either. He's four straight balls. I mean, the last two were close to the zone, but you've been throwing balls for the last, you know, six pitches. You're not going to get those calls from an umpire seeing that you've been wild. And so you walk low, and then subsequently you get the a two RBI single right there to pretty much cash the game over there. It was 3-2, White Sox dorming right there, available to get uh, a chance to win versus these Rangers, who even though they played the game poorly, and then the White Sox do the White Sox things. I don't know if that was a call by Ethan Katz, a call by Pedro Grafal, or Yaz and, and Bummer working together. Either way, but it's a dumb thing because I think you lose your pitcher's rhythm. He's doing well. I know he just got hit hard by Young, by Jung, but that guy's been hitting the ball hard all day long. Just either go four and say go to first automatically and I'll face the next guy, or go in battle versus Garcia. But regardless, I mean, that is... It's, it's Pedro should get the blame for that, mm-hmm. right? I mean, e- even if it's Yaz and Aaron Bummer's call, he's the manager, mm-hmm. right? I mean, if you don't want Aaron Bummer to face Adelis Garcia, take him out. Yes. He already faced three batters. You could take him out at that point. Correct. They didn't. Um, so n- no matter what, I mean, that's on Pedro. Can you flash that Garcia at bat again, Steven? Nick Hutter at 86.5. So that was one of the slower ones that he threw. I mean, just taking it, taking stuff off as well. He threw three. Uh, so one was at 87.6, one was at 86.4, that one's at 86.5. So, I mean, it, it, you possibly think, too, that he might be taking a little bit off of that pitch as well to try, try to locate it more off the zone um, because, it, again, it seemed like he was in such a rhythm. That's the first ball he pitches. Uh, it just seemed like absolutely uh, one that he was completely pitching away from. Uh, and, and, you know, Joe Kelly pitches the next inning. Mm-hmm. I mean, Joe Kelly versus Garcia would have been a pretty interesting matchup. I know Garcia can hit him pretty far, but... Uh, I don't know. Uh, it just just frustrating. I did like Fred's comment up there, wondering where all the Soxtopus have gone, right? And you mentioned Big Squid. Did the Soxtopus kill these rich people? The Soxtopus got ate by the Big Squid, and now the Big Squid's doing the Soxtopus. Okay, he's inside there. Right. I like. I, we should meet this Big Squid. Is the Big Squid who's more gettable for a podcast guest, Jerry Reinsdorf or the Big Squid? I think the big squid. I mean, right. and hey, I'm sure the post game of the big squid's like, hey man, they fucked around and they found out. Um, you know, <laughs> you know, I'm, you know, I've been down here for about 200 years. You know, saw when the first people came down here, Titanic. I was delicious eating, and now I've been waiting for another person to come down here, and uh, they fucked around, and uh, they're in my stomach now. He's going down to all those uh, fiber optic lines and cables connecting all of the internet and all of the Atlantic <laughs> Ocean, just touching down. And he has great internet. You know? Oh yeah, I mean, a great, great setup. Uh, his his Zoom call background is uh, ten out of ten. You know, really dark, but again, it's a, it's really interesting. Um, stupid joke right there. Anyways, um, 
<sighs> this game sucked. Uh, this it was game, boring. It was boring. Uh, Andrew Vaughn and Luis Robert go back to back, and that was interesting. But then again, you know, they get two runs. They tie up, the, or they, they're down one run. Um, you know, it's a 3-2 ball game heading into the seventh, and then, you know, it's exactly what you bring up is, is Aaron Bummer, again, just messing around, and they, they found out. Um, and they end up losing there 5-2. to two. Um, there, there isn't much to talk about from this game, another loss, but I guess the big thing is the Twins lost. We're just here. Well, and mm-hmm. the Tigers won, uh, which so, means the Royals lost, I think. <laughs> um, but... Correct. Sox are still five and a half games back. 31 and 43. They are 12 games under 500. But now the Twins, who are in first place, 36 and 37. Um, again, the, they're under 500 as a division leader. I mean, this is the one thing is even though we keep sitting here disappointed night in and night out with the Chicago White Sox, it's the same reason why Rick Hahn is just giving the same answers that he did a month ago to the beat writer about or beat writers about what um the White Sox are going to do with the trade deadline. We'll talk about that a little bit more after the break. But, I mean, again, like, they can play uninspiring baseball, but until Minnesota or Cleveland or Detroit. maybe even Detroit um, puts the nail in the coffin, the White Sox can just still stick around and maybe they'll get hot. Maybe yeah. maybe the boys will just start playing confidently. <laughs> How bad it is maybe. that Detroit is now back in front of you as the White Sox. Remember, the White Sox passed them up because the White's, Detroit didn't win a game what, until like the seventh game of June? Yeah. And now they're hotter than crap, a game and a half ahead of the White Sox with majority of their starting staff that they were depending on or about to depend on this year. Out. Like, out, out. Imagine if Lucas Giolito, Lance Lynn, Michael Kopech, and maybe even Dylan Cease were out for the year. Would the White Sox compete? No. It would be bad as hell. They have... Really good, not really good pitchers. They're good pitchers. They're starters out of the game, and they're picking people who what, the, the White Sox had to face the trash uh, of the Tigers pitchers, but they're doing the job. They're getting the job done and winning a bunch of games in a row. Yes, they're facing the Royals, but you saw what the White Sox did versus the Royals out there. Not very well. So kudos to Detroit, and I want Minnesota to be actually halfway decent so they can bury us. And I know Hans going to give us his answers in this podcast, as we replay what he, some of the things he said today to the assembled media, including our own Vinny Duber, but I still believe if the White Sox are this close, despite what Rick Hahn said about we're not trying to just win the AL Central, we're trying to see if we can compete in the playoffs, because we already know 12 games under 500 on June 18th or June 19th. Happy Juneteenth. Thank you. They're not going to be competing with any of these teams. And we're seeing them play versus teams that are in the playoffs. The Dodgers are going to be in the playoffs. The Mariners might be in the playoffs. These Rangers are going to be in the playoffs. We see how they compete. And so if that was his answer, there's no need to wait for another month and a half to trade players away. Get this stuff rolling right now because the White Sox are not going to be competing with those teams. Can they win the AL Central easily if they just start playing ball? But that's not what he said in this uh, clip that he's we're going to play later on. Yeah, and I, I mean, a lot of it, too, it's not inspiring from Rick Hahn. I mean, he just kind of said, you know, maybe they'll come out confident. Maybe, Rick. Uh, they, they didn't seem too confident. And the there. managers and coaches are not <laughs> to blame for this. No, because, that's again, what he said. it's the guy talking. It's it's the guy giving out the paychecks. Like, I, 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 we talked about this with our guy Jake, and he's just like, you know, Robert and Vaughn hit those homers and we start making a ton of noise Mm -hmm. and our GM Jake Flanagan comes over and he's like, you know, it always seems like whenever they start having good momentum and I come over, I, I just kill the, the momentum. And I'm like, Jake, like, I appreciate that you think you have that much power, but, um, Mm -hmm. no, like Mm -hmm. again, it, the white Sox for our two years of existence as a company Mm -hmm. have been a turd. Yes. It doesn't matter if Tony La Russa is driving the turd. It doesn't matter if Pedro Grafal is driving the turd. It is a turd. It is a six-year-old turd that Rick Hahn has presented us, you know, since mired in mediocrity, mm-hmm. and they have not polished it. They have not <laughs> made it nice and presentable. It has just stayed a big, giant turd. Yeah, and... I'm, I'm sorry to be so crass. And the person that is in charge of this turd... Won't fire himself. Why would he? He he runs the turd. 
Yeah. And there's, there's no. There's only 30 turds. Hey, man. And this is the thing. Somebody's asked, would you think that Rick Hahn would ever get fired? I'm like, no, he won't ever get fired. Jerry would just reshuffle them. As we were talking yesterday, Hostetler is still in the organization. <laughs> they didn't fire him. They just reassigned him. It's like, uh, Mike Shirley, it's your turn to, to actually do the job now. They don't fire people. I even think Doug Lauman, after he got fired, was still with the club. So, yeah, this is a thing where even if Rick Hahn is – Loses this year. The White Sox finish under 500. Should have been fired last year. Should have been fired a couple years ago. But, you know, this is the end of the rebuild, and he should be pro- uh, providing fruit. He hasn't. They'll just say, ah, Rick, um, be our contract negotiator or some made-up thing where it looks like he's got some great status, assistant to the owner with uh, consultant duties. Even Tony La Russa didn't even get fired. Right. He's had a heart a heart thing, which I hope he's fine, but he didn't get fired when he deserved to get fired. This is a pathetic organization that doesn't have the balls to actually do what is necessary to fire people who deserve to get fired. Ricky Renteri got fired while taking the team to the playoffs. It's 10th time in the playoffs. Ricky Renteria is like, yeah, you get your ass out of here. Like, that was the only guy that really gets fired. And then last year, we get Super Joe getting fired but daryl boston keep your job brother you're doing a great job no you're not hey um you suck daryl boston yeah, you, you you mentioned assistant director of something um do you know who the assistant director of player development is is it kirk hasler it's nepotism at its, at its finest it's kenny williams Ju- oh, jr oh my god i forgot they hired him yeah yeah i mean yeah they did they did it's chris getz is the assistant general manager of and uh How? leader of player development uh, director of Ma- Minor League Administration, uh, Kathy Potosky, or Potosky. Sorry if I um, messed that up. All my skis out there are going to be mad. All my all my Polacks are going to be mad at me. Um, assistant Director of Player Development, Kenny Williams Jr. Oof. Kenny Williams Jr. Do you see where Nick Hostetler is? Where in the organization he got reassigned to? It's just like, ugh. Like, can we just, if the guy's not getting the job done, I think that person will also say, you know what? I'm a grown person. I didn't get the job done. Thank you. I'll see you later. Specialist. Yeah. Uh, special assistant to general manager. Yes. And two weeks ago, he was on the White Sox Talk podcast talking about Jake Berger's comeback story. Yeah. Oh, Fire I'm, I'm somebody. Right now. Ooh, I don't want, you know, Hostetler's probably a good guy, but the job you paid him for, he didn't succeed. This guy, Rick Hahn, the job you're paying him for. He's not succeeding. Let's make sure that we have throughout the organization know know how that, hey, this organization is no nonsense. We're about championships. If you don't get the job done, we're not afraid to move on from you, not reshuffle you into a different spot, actually move you to somewhere else. Well, and a grumpy pig with friends, uh, a grumpy pig and friends, and I think that's going to be when we have a pig on July 4th when the Sox are three and a half games back at the AL Central. They won't be. Won't be. Um, but why is it so hard the rebuild failed? The team didn't match the hype. Um, again, I just they, they didn't do it right. Uh, the team just didn't have the right bones. It wasn't built correctly, and um, we're, we're just kind of seeing it crumble now. Uh, 12 of their last 16 uh, plays where they have uh, driven in a run, uh, so the last 16 uh, RBI events, um, have been home runs. 11 of those 16 have been solo home runs. Um we saw Clint Frazier in the ninth inning draw their first walk. Just really sloppy and messy and consistently frustrating stuff. Um, we're going to take a break here. We do have Rick Hahn video, and we'll probably set that up with Vinny Duber uh, right after this break. Uh, Herb, get comment at read ready if you can. All right. Um, I'm ready. But buying tickets to your favorite events shouldn't be so stressful. I know Herb might be stressed out trying to pull up that ComEd read, but Game Time is the fastest and easiest way to buy tickets to all the sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. And with killer deals on last-minute tickets and their best price guarantee, you could stop stressing over the tickets and start getting hyped for all the fun you'll have. They have flash-minute deals and last-minute tickets. Easy to find and to buy tickets for every kind of event in your area. Again, uh, sports, comedy, music, theater, and the Game Time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less, Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference and 
their lovely lovely support support staff will get you your money as fast as possible herb got the game time guarantee and got his money back uh in 12 minutes Correct. so again these people are trying to get you the best deal without having you stress so if you you know need the game time guarantee they're gonna guarantee it um I don't know if that makes any sense. Snag the tickets out the stress. Game time. Download the game time app. Create an account and use code CHGO for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code CHGO for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets. Lowest price guaranteed. Interested to go to a Pride Night. I think that's on Wednesday. Uh, the Rangers don't have a Pride Night. The White Sox do. Funny enough, the Rangers play the White Sox on Pride Night. Yeah. The Combat Energy Efficiency Program is committed to helping families and businesses in the communities they serve, helping manage energy usage and lower energy bills. Now and into the future. Yeah, ComEd offers a wide variety of incentives on lighting and other efficiency upgrades to commercial, industrial, and public sector customers of all sizes across the territory. ComEd also offers free facility assessments that can help find energy-saving opportunities like for HVAC systems, commercial kitchen equipment, or industrial processes. How does that work, Sean? Well... An authorized engineer will work with you to develop a detailed assessment plan specific to your goals and needs, and these can be done in person or virtually and last approximately two hours and within three to four weeks customers will receive a report detailing energy efficiency projects they could start working on immediately i didn't do any justice there uh, each recommendation will include estimated energy savings cost saving project cost potential incentives and simple payback if you own a business do not wait get started saving money and energy today for energy saving tips lighting incentives or to schedule your free facility assessment go to comment.com slash powering biz is that comment.com slash powering biz and biz is spelled b-i-z scheduled today Hi, Vinny. Fellas, how are we? We're looking good. Uh, it it kind of looks like you're in an airplane. You don't have your typical American flag behind you, so it kind of looks like you're uh, sitting in the cabin of an airplane. Hope you have a safe flight. Uh, you can follow Vinny Duber on his uh, flight here uh, uh, on Twitter, at Vinny Duber. He's our CHGO White Sox beat writer, and he has a brand new article up at allchgo.com, and you could read about that, or you could read that, uh, again, all, all at uh, allchgo.com. It's about uh, what we're going to talk about basically for the rest of the podcast. Uh, Rick Hahn spoke to the media today. Um, we haven't played the video just yet, um, and it starts after his opening comments, but I, I thought the opening comments drew a lot of interest, a, a lot of reaction. I don't know if we have much to say about it, but it's been weird to see a lot of the national reporting on the White Sox, and we did see a little bit of passion from Rick Hahn trying to defend his team today from some of the national reports, right? Well, I mean, more so just talking about something that really didn't uh, align with anything that this team has been saying all year long. I mean, I, I, if there's one thing that Rick Hahn has done consistently all year, it's point out that his first year manager who showed up to a team that was already put together is not the guy to blame for uh, what has gone wrong here. Um, now, I don't know if we can say that the manager of a baseball team deserves zero blame when it is 12 games under 500, but what Rick Hahn has said is that Pedro and this coaching staff is not where people should be uh, casting their the greatest amount of their ire. Um, and for all the people who were in my Twitter mentions today, and boy, there were a lot of them, who were very upset that Rick Hahn isn't taking the blame himself, they conveniently forgot about the whole put it on me uh, episode from a few weeks ago. So um, I, I think that he uh, is, is plenty forthright with who... Uh, you know, you blame when something like this go goes so sideways. So um, I, I don't think that means you're going to hear the uh, two words that you all want to hear uh, uh, come out of Rick Hahn's mouth. But I do think um, that it is very consistent with what he said all year long. And when you heard something, if you heard something on the radio today from someone who uh, is a national reporter and not a local reporter who hasn't been in those media sessions, um, it makes sense that that context would be missing. So I, I just want to present this to the group because I find it interesting because, you know, I mean, you worked in radio for 20 years. Obviously, Vinny, you've been uh, a big J journalist for about 10 years now since since you've been out of college. Um, uh, it, I find it interesting that Bob Nightingale on that same station said something very similar about a week ago. And obviously, Rick didn't talk a week ago, so it's tough for him to make those comments when that happens. But he didn't mention calling Bob Nightingale, who also reported that some White Sox players are ready to ask for trades but haven't yet. And I, I think I'm uh, paraphrasing Bob here. But it, it's odd that we are hearing, you know, that he talked to John Heyman about John Heyman's comments. But Bob Nightingale just made similar comments more recently on the same airwaves, on the same show. 
I did hear that. I mean, that's why I said, like, I thought that Bob had said it a week before. I thought it was crap at the time Bob said it. And of course, a hundred percent, I thought it's crap when John Heyman says it. Cause you know, source, maybe it's the joking tone that, you know, Tony deserves two plaques in, in Cooperstown. Maybe that's why he gets a little bit more of a slide, but hey, it's just, it, 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 it was an odd, odd, odd tone. Um, Anything else to add? I, I know it's it's a completely different thing. It, it doesn't actually matter to the White Sox. No. Okay. But right. also, I wanted to ask Vinny before we go on to yeah. Rick Hahn stuff. Like today, we're discussing the play in the seventh inning where it looked like Aaron Bummer was pitching around Adelise Garcia and then subsequently walks the next guy who was a lefty in Nathaniel Lowe. Was there any discussion after the game about that decision and how it pretty much looked like Aaron Bummer lost his release point after he pitched around out of Lise Garcia? There was no discussion of that. Um, I mean, I think this was, again, uh, a night to focus on the offense and the lack thereof. Uh, I mean, listen, two runs is, is not going to cut it in most Major League Baseball games, even if you are finally hitting the ball out of the ballpark like the White Sox are starting to do. Um they're not hitting it out of there with anybody on base. So, uh, you know, the, the offense didn't come through tonight when it had chances to do so in the eighth and ninth inning. A lot of strikeouts instead of uh, coming through with guys on base. So uh, that was the focus tonight. Uh, the game was not lost, uh, as you know, because of uh, what Aaron Bummer did in the seventh inning, which really was the first poor performance, really the only poor pitching performance of the evening uh, because the bullpen game kind of worked out pretty swimmingly aside from that one inning. Um, but... Uh, you know, it was already three to nothing, and they lost five to two. So um, there, or yeah, at, at one point it was three to nothing, and they lost five to two. Uh, if you're gonna if you're gonna throw the blame on Aaron Bummer for uh, adding an extra two runs there, well, the offense still loses it regardless. So yeah, I, we brought up the stat before you joined. Uh, Eleven of the last sixteen RBI events for the White Sox have been solo home runs. Uh, has Pedro talked about that? Because again. They got two solo homers, which I'm not trying to complain about. I, I love homers. Uh, we know that. But just more solo homers. Uh, and again, Pedro talked about the desire for this team to cut down chasing out of the zone and maybe walking more. And again, we didn't see uh, the Sox first walk until the ninth inning with Clint Frazier. So did he talk about at least the kind of just solo bust or, or solo uh, homers or nothing? Yeah, obviously, we would prefer there to be a lot of guys on base <laughs> ahead of him. I think uh, uh, he, he, he shares White Sox fans' opinions in, on that one. Um, he mentioned briefly that, uh, you know, part of the lineup reconstruction, I would assume he's referring to swapping Andrew Benintendi and Tim Anderson uh, there, uh, it has to do with trying to get guys on base, trying to get more, uh, more things happening for this offense. Because as we've been talking about for weeks now, um, it's inconsistencies and, uh, it's long stretches of doing nothing have really been, um, what has kept this team down and kept it from, from rebounding the way that everybody thinks it should, because the pitching has really been really good, um, uh, for the most part. So, uh, yeah, he, he would like to see some more guys on base too. What did Pedro have to say about the update on Tim Anderson and his health? Uh, so he's day to day. Uh, it's possible that he'll might be uh, might be back in that lineup tomorrow. Uh, they just got to have to kind of see and uh, we're we'll wait and see how he feels. Uh, it's a shoulder. It's an, a nagging shoulder right now. And uh, Pedro said it's not really that big of a deal. Nothing to be concerned too much about. And that's why he's not on the injured list. You'd have to imagine. Um, but it's also why he's been out of the lineup uh, for the last two days. Yeah, and you have video for us uh, from Rick Hahn speaking about. Uh, obviously, you know, what we talked about earlier with the, the national reporter, but we're going to focus mostly on the White Sox and what their focus is for the trade deadline uh, with this video coming up. I was going to look for something, but uh, also in this is uh, mention of Jose Rodriguez. Uh, Romy Gonzalez hits the IL, uh, and we do have a little bit of Rick commenting on Popeye uh, getting the call up to major le uh, the major leagues. Uh, we did not see him tonight in the lineup, uh, but it is possible that, uh, you know, maybe we see him at second base tomorrow or something like that. We'll see. Um, but let's go to Rick on, and then we'll come back. We'll take a break, and then we'll talk about what Rick had to say and what this team should be focusing on uh, at the deadline. But here's about seven minutes of Rick Hahn talking about where this team is and how Vinny noted uh, in his piece, you know, the last time Rick Hahn spoke to the media, they were about five and a half games back in the AL Central. He spoke today. There are five and a half games back in the AL Central. So not much has changed, even though uh, the month has. But here is Rekhan speaking about what is uh, their thoughts as the trade deadline approaches at August 1st. You uh, you talked to us on Memorial Day, I guess it was. I've never talked to us since then, but in this group. Um, 
you said that it was too early to decide on the direction of the team. Now, obviously, right. you sit here five and a half back. You also sit here 11 games under 500. Yeah. Do you have a better idea of this team? And and is when you and this may be a silly question, but is when you analyze everything and start to break down what kind of moves you're going to make, is winning a division, even if it's not a great division, enough to, to push you forward? Kind of thing? The goals have always been higher than just making the playoffs. Uh, I will say that given our performance so far, our only way in is through winning the division, which based on the performance relative to the rest of the division this year, it's been everything's been a little bit down, which makes that more attainable than a wild card spot. Um, if we're able to turn this around and get ourselves in a position to win this division, given that we are currently 11 under, we are obviously going to be playing pretty damn good baseball for the final two, three months of the season, which would give us reason to believe that the postseason performance could be better. Uh, making the playoffs is important, but again, the goals are loftier than that, and when we judge ultimately what happens as we get much closer to August 1st than we are now, how we project our ability not only to win the division, but to make an impact in October is going to factor in. In that in that vein, yeah. have the last few weeks been in, informative at all? Somewhat. I mean, look, we looked at the schedule going in the Yankee Stadium and then playing a good Marlins team and going to Dodger Stadium in Seattle and now playing a really good Texas team that we, we knew this path was going to be difficult for this two, probably actually three to four week stretch leading up to the break. Uh, and we've been a tick under 500 in that stretch, so it hasn't been devastating, but it absolutely hasn't been a, a significant step forward. I mean, uh, you can't remove April. That's not how this works. Uh, we have been a tick above 500-ish since that rotten start. Uh, that's fine, but that's not what we need to be if we're going to, again, make a run in this division and feel like we have a chance to do damage in October. So it's been okay, but it hasn't been as impactful as we would hope. Do you feel like you're still paying the price from April? Yeah, actually, I was talking to Haven this morning about that. You know, you, you we're, we, I hope we're not proving the old baseball axiom that you can't win a pennant in April, but you can lose one. Uh, because, yeah, we're, what, 11 under, and we had a 10-game winning losing streak. So you remove that, and then all of a sudden we're right in the thick of things. But that's not how it works. The fact that we... Probably, you know, out of those 10 games, I think four of them were real close or we were leading close and late and should have won those damn those games. Like, don't get those back. Like, we're going to have to make that up on our own going forward. And, and thus far, over this tough stretch of the schedule, yeah, we've treaded water, but we've yet to really go on that run. And we're going to need that run here in the next few weeks before we, you know, up against August 1st. Jose Rodriguez is up today. Yeah. Uh, I'm, you know, maybe what did you like about what he was doing is kind of an obvious question. Maybe more interesting would be who's in double A. Yeah. How do you feel his progression is going and, and what warranted a jump I, to the big I don't leagues? Think this is, I mean, this is a little taste for him of the big leagues. Uh, we'll see how much he plays in the in the coming days. We obviously have a little bit of uh, uh, <laughs> health issues right now, so we wanted to make sure we were covered. Romy's. Uh, shoulder was not permitting him in recent days to really do anything more than pinch run, and we wanted to make sure we had uh, some defensive coverage here. Uh, Sosa, as you may know, is just coming off the IL and AAA with an oblique issue, so we didn't feel like rushing him back made a lot of sense. Rushing him to Chicago on his first day back made sense. And uh, Popeye's been on a nice little streak, and he's a very intriguing prospect going forward. Get him up here for some period of time, maybe get him a little exposure. Uh, to how we do things here, and, and if and when the time comes back that he returns to the minors, it's probably better for this experience and get maybe some of those initial uh, nerves out of the way so that next time when it's for perhaps a longer period of time that he's able to hit the ground running. I guess is there a reason then why, I mean, you clearly have individual talent if you look yeah. at it across the board. Why, as a group, it's not, it hasn't felt I don't have the answer for that in all Canada. Uh, it's not for lack of individual confidence. It's not for lack of support from the staff. It's not from lack of communication about expectations and what guys that we feel guys are capable of doing. Um, I think it's been, again, we, we've been digging ourselves out of a hole for a while now, and it's a little tough to perhaps have that edge when you, you know, 
or swimming upstream. Now again, you guys want to start showing that tonight, despite the record. That's great. I think I think that confidence served us well for you know an extended period of time, and it'd be good to get that back. You What's your was an igniter? Yeah, uh, it kind of piggybacking off of Merck right there. Yeah. But He's been out of the lineup. It's been well, it's significant tough. below yeah. one through nine. Have, have you felt that the offense is trying to pick that? I think pick uh, up that uncharacteristic season. Not just from TA. I mean, uh, to the TA's absence. I, I think a lot of it comes down to the record. I mean, there, there's so many times this year. And I was talking to the GM of another team this morning as well, who was lamenting his team's performance with you know bases loaded, nobody out, or runners in scoring position. But I th- and it's a team that people would say has been underachieving, like us. Um, and I think so often when those opportunities arise and the team isn't playing well, the guys you know, try to hit a five-run home run. Like, right now I'm going to get us back in. Here's my opportunity. And instead of just letting the, the talent take over and then the game come to them, that's when you see the pressing most, I think, is in those instances. Uh, and not having your full lineup, whether it's TA or somebody else, I think that does – lend to the other guys in those situations you know, again pressing um, but it's a it's a talented group it is a confident group even if they're not showing it and they know what they're capable of doing it's just a matter of us getting it is there a leadership uh, issue at all that you see just in terms of you know players on the field you look around there players individually yeah uh, I get why there's that speculation, uh, because again, if the team's not performing well and you're not seeing that sort of, again, edge or swagger or whatever, that could be not coming from the player group or the player group isn't setting that tone. Uh, I don't feel that's the issue going on. I don't feel like there's an absence or a lack of cohesiveness or, you know, every man for himself kind of thing, lack of preparation. Uh, Again, that's not what I think is ailing us, but I understand the speculation. All right, uh, a lot in there that I thought was interesting from Rick Hahn. I know a lot of people are just kind of frustrated that this team is 12 games under 500 and don't really want to hear it. Uh, and like Vinny said, they just kind of want to hear those two words. Uh, I don't think those two words are ever going to come. Uh, I think there need to be two words from a certain man, but I don't think those are going to come either. Um, but I want to get into a little bit of Popeye, then we'll take a break, and then we'll talk a little bit more about the uh, the division title. Um would you expect them to play Jose Rodriguez tomorrow? Because they did want to get him a little bit of exposure. But as Herb mentioned, we kind of saw this with Lenin Sosa, and it was tough for him to find playing time last year in 2022. Yeah, I don't expect there to be a ton of playing time for Jose Rodriguez. I think, to be quite honest, that you heard it from Rick Hahn in that clip, uh, if Lenin Sosa wasn't cu- just coming off the injured list, it probably would have been Lenin Sosa that was called up today. Um Jose Rodriguez is here to because Romy Gonzalez can't be here. Uh, he's going to be a reserve and a fill-in. I, I wouldn't wouldn't be surprised if they uh, you know put him in there as a pinch runner or if he gets a start or you know something like that. But he's not here to be you know a prospect who's ready to hit the big leagues. He's here to be a backup infielder because the team needs it right now. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't expect a ton of playing time for Jose. I mean, it did seem like there was room on the 40, man. I, I am just a little bit surprised that they didn't even call up, you know, Pedro's guy, Hanser, just because he did kind of start hitting a hot streak down in double A. It's kind of a, I feel, a, a aggressive promotion. But again, if he's just going to sit on the bench, um, I'm not sure what it's doing for him besides halting his progression down in double A. But we'll see. I mean, um, I can I can, I can, can answer that, or I can give you the answer that they gave, gave to that question, yeah. which is that they think that this exposure is good. You come up and you see what life in the big leagues is like, is how your routine can apply to a, a higher level. They think that exposure is, is good for the player, helpful. Let's put it this way, not harmful um, in, in terms of seeing what – what life is like up here and maybe uh, a thing or two you can take from a, from a veteran who's been around for a while. So um, I get what you're saying, but also, you know, they need a body. Absolutely. That's what you have the minor leagues for. (laughs) <laughs> for sure. Um, I, I, no, I, I totally get the reasoning. Uh, let's take a quick break, and then we'll talk a little bit about um, what Rick Hahn had to say in Vinny's uh, article, the, the, the topic of Vinny's article um, from today, again, all at, up at allchgo.com. 
Um, take on the sun with gear built to last. Our friends at Shady Rays have you covered with the warm weather ahead with premium polarized shades at an affordable price. A beautiful day here in Chicago, a beautiful sunny day. And Shady Rays is an independent sunglasses company that offers a world-class product that's just as good as any expensive pair we've worn. They have durable frames and extremely care optics for outdoor adventures. And that's not all. Shady Rays offers the most insane protection program in all of eyewear. Every pair of sunglasses backed by lost and broken replacements. If you lose or broke or break your pair, even on day one, they told us that they will send you a brand new pair. No questions asked. You can wear your Shady Rays with confidence because they have your back long after your purchase. And if you don't love your Shady Rays, you can exchange them for a new pair or return them for free within 30 days. There's no risk when you shop. Their team always has your back. Exclusively for listeners, Shady Rays is giving out their best deal of the season. Go to ShadyRays.com and use code CHGO for 50% off two plus pairs of polarized sunglasses. Try for yourself the shades rated five stars by over 250,000 people. Use code CHGO at ShadyRays.com. For 50% off two plus pairs of polarized sh- shades. They're sunglasses, but I think I think I could take the liberty to call them shades. Um, let's go to FOCO. They donated this lovely South Paul bobblehead. Um, they also gave us a TA one as well. Um, some lovely set pieces, and you can go show them some love at foco.com. That's F O C O.com, or click the link in the description below. And for online pre sale items, just the promo code CHGO for 10% off. You can get fitted in the best sports gear around over at foco.com. They have hoodies, shoes, signs, bobbleheads, and everything in between. And since it's spring and baseball season, they have Aloha shirts, straw hats, polos, bags everything you need for a game. So check out foco.com or click the link in the description below for online pre-sale items. Use promo code CHGO for 10% off. Um, I, I thought it was interesting that, you know, obviously Rick Hahn understands where this team is at and it's going to be difficult, nearly impossible for them to get into the playoffs as a wild card. But it, it does seem that it feels like maybe if they get to 10 games back, that's when they're going to hit the eject button. Like, I don't know. It just seems like Rick Khan kind of just has his hand over the eject button because it doesn't seem like this team is really proving themselves to be a playoff contender. I think that's quite obvious to people who are watching White Sox baseball this year. I, I, I thought the comments about, you know, that's our only way in, but how competitive can we be? Uh, were interesting from Rick Hahn. I don't, I don't know what you took away from that, Vinny, I guess. Yeah, I read your article, so I do. But <laughs> Yeah, there you go. Just and Everyone go read it, and I'll just I'll sit here and wait. Um, <laughs> the, uh, no, the, the most interesting, the most impactful, the most important thing that he said today, that outlined today, was this, and was basically winning a bad AL Central might not be enough for them to become the traditional buyer this year if they see an ability to compete in the postseason as the al central champion they will they if they see this team playing much better baseball that obviously would be necessary by the way to dig themselves out of this hole that they're in then okay bolster this team go try to go for it here in 2023 what he said though was and i asked him this would it be possible that winning a division is not is, is is takes a back seat or a, a is a less priority a lo- lower priority than competing for the longer term because of course what has Rick Hahn said during this entire rebuilding process they don't want to just be a team that wins one division and goes away they want to be a team that has contention on the mind on an on a yearly basis they might make a move even if they're within contention of the division they might make a move that looks like a seller kind of move because they don't see this team moving far into the playoffs, even if they do sneak in as the champions of the AL Central. I just, I'm just flabbergasted. And I know Rick's got to do his thing before every game. I just don't know what he does well. And I don't know who is going to step up to the plate and make this team what it needs to be because his career tenure is 731 and 860 for a 569 winning percentage he shouldn't be making these decisions to go forward or plunge this whole roster. Like that is my problem with the white Sox right now. You have the architect still making the bad decisions on the building that's crumbling. And so I just need for somebody adult in the room, Jerry Ryan's to wake up Kenny Williams to actually have something about himself and fire this whole staff because it's not working. We keep on going. That's why in Memorial Day, they were five and a half games out. They're five and a half games out here on Juneteenth. Every 
damn holiday we're going to be going to. The next one's going to be July 4th. They're going to be five and a half games out. So what's the difference? Like, they're not competing. We all know they're not going to be competing in the playoffs. The 100%. The teams that they're going against right now are playoff caliber teams, and they're not competing. So I just want – I understand he has to speak, and I understand that we got to listen, but he never says anything. He never says anything of value, of, like, what, how we're losing, why we're losing. It's well, just I, gen- generic word I salad all day I, long. I, I, I hear that a little bit, but even in what we played there, he talked about how a bad April can sink you. You can't win a division title in April, but you can lose one. And you always said, you know, every game counts. You've brought up it's early before. Um, That 7-21 and stretch could kill them. Because, again, they're one game, I think, above 500. Now I think they're at 500 um, since April, right? I mean, they're really not pulling in either direction. And even then, later on, when Rick's talking about confidence with these players, um, I tried to, you know, write down a little bit of this, um, but... Not individual confidence. It's tough to have that edge when they're losing. If guys want to show that, uh, show us that tonight, despite the record, that'd be great. And and it wasn't really, I mean, enthusiastic from Rick. I I don't I don't know if there's a ton of energy in that room. And that was the big thing that Pedro Grafal said that he wanted to bring to this team this off season. And just with the losing record and kind of the up and down. And hey, we just swept Detroit, but here comes all the playoff teams to to push us down, I I feel like it's just tough to build that momentum and that confidence. I mean, guys, he was asked point blank why the team is not playing well. And he said he does, or why the team, why this collection of talented players is not having success. I should rephrase that. He said, I, he said he didn't know. He said he can't answer the question. And, and I think at the end of the day, that is the right answer. It's very frustrating to hear if you're a White Sox fan, but it is, I mean, it is the answer. Look at this. This is the roster they built that that four, let's say what now, four years ago, Every that's the roster everyone wanted. That's the roster that everyone looked at all, everybody in the minor leagues and said, oh boy, wait till this roster is on the field. Wait till they have these guys, right? Right. And, and listen, prospects don't pan out sometimes. That's baseball. That happens. Um, but I think the vast majority of people who have uh, followed this team either closely or from afar, be they – people who have sat in those seats every single day or uh, a national writer who, who tuned in to, you know, every, every few months, I think everybody's shocked. I don't think anybody has an answer for why this hasn't worked. And I guess the question, the, the, the thing is it just, it just hasn't. And that sucks. If you're a White Sox fan, that sucks if you're the White Sox. But at the end of the day, People are, uh, you know, looking for some honesty from 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 the front office. I think that's pretty honest right there. Well, I mean, I, I don't know if I would say he doesn't know or we don't know what killed the White Sox and this core. Because, I mean, again, we know what killed the Titanic. It was an iceberg. I think what killed this core is injuries. I mean, again, the TA right. storyline has been a discussion this entire year he wasn't injured last year but Aloy was right um Grandal was like I mean that's just been consistent we saw uh the stats and all the stats of when those five guys play together they win ball games just those guys are not healthy like why this core failed they were never healthy I mean and even you know Jeff Passett if we want to bring in all these national writers like I think there was some article that ESPN wrote at the start of 2020 just saying like this is going to be the team of this decade like the Chicago White Sox are going to be the team of this decade what derailed them is very clear, injuries. And I, I never think that they went full go with this team and pushing this team to their max potential by surrounding them with the right players. And we could, again, you know, pick that apart with second base and right field being consistent issues, Edwin Encarnacion filling the DH spot in 2020. But at the end of the day, it's the players that they tied themselves to have been hurt. But you got to help yourself with player development and the player development system has been crap. Right, Minor but, leagues have been bad. Like, we've had multiple, multiple first-round picks on other teams now playing badly on those teams, too. Nick Magical, to name one. Zach Collins is another one. Carson Fulmer, another one. Like, those are two, three top ten picks by Rick Hahn and his staff that just didn't, didn't uh, fail. I mean, didn't uh, work out. Like, and you see the players behind them actually be great. So, this is not just the players being hurt. It's the 
front office not doing anything to supplement the roster when needed to. We've talked about the endless cycle of right fielders, and now we're still having problems at second base. For how long? Like, it's these things, like it is the players, but it's also understanding who your players are and saying, you know what? We can't just have this core be together and hope for health. We have to actually make that happen. Let's go and maybe trade a player away out of this core and get a player that's a little bit more res- reliant on playing every day instead of, hey, if Aloy plays 150, watch out type of stuff. It's, it's foolhardy seeing the same things happen and then not changing what's wrong about the team and then just crossing your fingers and hoping everything goes right. I just think that's what the, the whole philosophy is, and that philosophy is a loser. So then what will determine where the White Sox go? And is it just what offer is presented to them? Because I think the quote that really stuck out to me was, it's reasonable to speculate about all that. And Rick was just kind of going through, you know, about all these different ways and do you try to make a team or a trade to reinforce the 2024 or 2025 team? But um, he said, there's a lot of time before the market really plays out. Like, I mean, we discussed the Tigers leapfrogging the White Sox after the White Sox started off June by sweeping them. The Tigers have a run differential of negative 74. The Sox have a run differential of negative 60, yet the Tigers are above them in the AL Central. Like, the White Sox have all this talent, talent that we thought could be a World Series core, and a lot of national people thought this. If the right deal comes along where Lucas Giolito and Tim Anderson can be traded, I I don't think that the White Sox would, would turn their nose at it. Again, like, I don't know where this team is going, It could just be a very stagnant direction at the trade deadline. It could just be another trade deadline where they sit on their hands, but I don't think Rakan's going to be as frustrated as he was in 2022. Or it could be, hey, the right deal presented it to us ourselves, and we really like the outlook for the team in 2024. Like, I mean, I wouldn't put them, I I really wouldn't put past anything besides trading Luis Robert, really, at this point. Yeah, I think. I think you're, I th- yeah, I think that's what he basically said today. And I, I think you're going to see a lot of things determine which way they go. They've got a little bit of time here if they want to start playing better. <laughs> you know what I mean? If they want to start racking up some wins, they got they got about a month, maybe a little less than a month, but a, around a month in which to do that to say, to convince the front office to, to do something to, to add to this team. Um, but yeah, I think it's going to be based on what they can get back for some of these people, and and, and we've we've discussed this often, and and you've said, oh, you know, maybe you would think TA or or whoever. That's just an example, or whoever would be an attractive trade candidate for a team, but is he not? And because of the way he's playing, is is you know the injury and the numbers, is that going to make the return nothing? And in which case, why would they make the deal just to get? to just to get anything um, when they could hold on to someone like that and they could just be good again next year when they're healthy. So um, there's a lot of different routes they could go, but certainly the market as Han called it and referred to repeatedly today uh, is going to be one of those main factors in determining what moves they make. Because I think right now nobody's expecting them to look significantly better than they've looked over the last even even since the end of april right even since the end of april which has just been meh middling kind of thing um i don't if the criteria is a team that looks like it can make a run in october then the white Sox have not met that yet and they would have to start playing significantly better in order to meet that criteria even though they are perfectly close to meeting the criteria of team capable of winning the AF Central because, you know, listen, it's been weeks since Memorial Day. They're in the same spot. They look like they can win the AL Central. They also don't look very good. So, you know, it, it's um, as those two things existing, I think, needs to start sh- shooting out of our heads a little bit and start moving toward, is that a team that looks like a contender for something, a team that can win a series against a team from the AL East or a team from the AL West. Right. Like, I mean, what what stuck out to me is just been Luis Robert as a star. It seems like Mike Trout syndrome. You have a star in center field that's going to give you eight war, and you really don't have anything else behind him or, or, or around him. That is a for sure cornerstone of this team that is going to be there. Because Aloy, I know, is talented, but again, he's played like 50% of the game since 2020. I know what you're saying, and I would err on the side of keeping Luis Robert. No, but, I am. I am. But I'm saying not, they, they kept Mike Trout. I'm not saying trade Mike no, no, Trout. I'll, but I'm saying no. 
think about trading Luis Robert because what what are you else going to have? You're going to trade everybody else or trade other players and then just have Luis Robert with a bunch of scrubs for what, five years and then his contract's up? Like, think about it. You have him playing at his best ball, young, cost control. Play, teams will be all of, over getting Luis Robert, and maybe you get a steal. Maybe you get something while he's at his peak of his playing while you're, as a White Sox, and you think about getting him on some other team, and then the rebuild comes quicker because you get actual major league ready players immediately. I, I'm, that's, I just think it's a more of a strategy to win than hold Luis Robert, hope and pray that next year they're going to win the free agent market yeah, again, and that all these players that they traded for, all the rest of the players who are not good, come up and play good. Just that's because they happen. get a new crop of guys with potential means that the guy making the same trade and the same moves is going to make a, a contender. Like Again, it's the, the issues of the White Sox are... Yes. Rick Hahn, it's not Luis Robert Jr. And I, I think Luis Robert Jr. Is just gives them a leg up on trying to make something that re- resembles a contender that he's trying to see in this team that's just not there. But I'm saying you can have Luis Robert, and especially this team, that sees a player that's making a lot of money, and they say we can spread that money out that that one player is making over five or six positions. With Luis Robert, you can get multiple players available to play next year, the year after, and fill out that roster and have more of a balanced uh, lineup where you're not depending on three or four guys to just be off and go off. You can have a little bit more certainty of what those five players are doing. I think you have to entertain and not be, hey, Luis Robert and Lucas Giolito and, oh, Lucas Giolito will be gone, but Dylan Cease are off limits. No, you got to keep your mind open. This is a terrible team. 12 games behind 500. Everybody's up. No, 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 no. Untouchable. Zero. Even though if they're Luis Robert. Oh, no, Rick Hahn's untouchable. You've called him Teflon Hahn. Um, that's Vinny Duber. You can follow him on Twitter. I call him Teflon Rick, and then Beeflo said Teflon Hahn. I was like, God damn, that was such much a better A lot nickname. better. <laughs> uh, that's Vinny Duber. You can follow him on Twitter at Vinny Duber. He's our CHGO White Sox beat writer. Um, you could read his latest piece at All CHGO talking about what Rick Hahn had to say about the White Sox. And again, I don't think it's a rigging endorsement as you end the article from Rick Hahn uh, with his quote saying they're treading water. I mean, we've talked this talk about this as a, a war of attrition. And really, I mean, if they don't drown, they'll win the AL Central. Uh, but doesn't that mean they'll just drown when they face yes. a, a team that's much stronger, bigger, and, you know, uh, more of a well-oiled machine? I don't know if you need to be well-oiled to swim well. I don't I don't swim well. Uh, that's Herb Lawrence. You can follow him on Twitter at Eknerwall23. He's our CHGO White Sox community leader. Floaties. Yeah, I need floaties, too. The White Sox need floaties. Uh, I'm Sean Anderson. You can follow me on Twitter at Sean underscore W underscore Anderson. Anything else? We got Dylan Cease and Nathan Eovaldi tomorrow. Uh, should be a good pitching matchup. Should be a good pitch match. I'm maybe, looking maybe, forward to it. There was a it was it was real quick for about f- six innings there, and then it really started to slow down. So hopefully Nathan Eovaldi and Dylan Cease can just keep it uh, brisk for us tomorrow. Uh, again, that's Vinny. That's Herb. Uh, thank you to Stephen Nicholas for producing the show, and we got Aaron Bummer work uh, a, a amount of likes, which is uh, I think fitting. So uh, make sure you're hitting that thumbs up button. We're gonna end it now at Aaron Bummer likes. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Go Sox.